Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute, and welcome to Aerospace Nation. It's my honor to have Secretary of the Air Force, Frank Kindle, with us today. As the senior civilian leader for the Department of the Air Force, both the Space Force and the Air Force fall under his purview. And it's no secret that he has a tremendous amount on his plate. The US faces concerted peer competition, thanks to China and Russia. Middle tier actors like North Korea and Iran continue to complicate things. All the while, non-state actors persist. Relative to these challenges, the demand for air and space power is growing. And because of this demand and three decades of fiscal neglect, neither the Air Force nor Space Force is sufficiently sized or equipped to handle the challenges they face. For 27 years in a row now, the Department of the Air Force has ranked last among the other services in funding. And since 9-11, the Army has received over $1 trillion or an average of $53 billion a year more than the Air Force. And that's a major reason why airmen are strapping into jets that their grandfathers flew. It's also why guardians are stretched too thin trying to meet threats from China in space. As events in Europe and the Pacific all too clearly demonstrate, our potential adversaries get a vote as to when and how they challenge US interests. Our air and space forces can't build competent operators or relevant equipment with the flip of a switch. It takes years to develop these sorts of capabilities and capacity. So in that context, the challenges facing Secretary Kendall are immense. And given what air and space power mean to the nation, failure simply isn't an option. Now here's the good news. The course the Secretary has outlined in recent months is right on target. His seven operational imperatives and the focus and structure necessary to deliver in key focus areas. So with that bit of introduction, Mr. Secretary, thanks very much for being here today. And I'll turn the podium over to you. That's great to be with you, Dave. Uh, happy to have the opportunity. Uh, we are working on a number of problems. Uh, I do think we have the resources to prevail if we focus them on the right problems and spend them in the right way. And that's what, that's what we're trying to accomplish. You know, the seven imperatives that Dave mentioned are designed to get at uh, what I see as the most pressing problems facing us, particularly against our pacing challenge. Uh, and of course, that's China. Uh, we're sitting here today waiting, uh, I think with bated breath is fair, for what's gonna happen in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, but to me, China uh, strategically and for the long term, because of its resources and because of its ambitions is the greater threat, even though we have very pressing problems, as you mentioned, not just Russia, but others around the world as well. It's a lot to deal with. Uh, and, and thank you for your support over the years as we've, the Air Force and Department of Defense have tried to do that. Yes, sir. Well. Um, you know, that's the whole purpose of the Mitchell Institute is uh, to support the Department of the Air Force and how we can best exploit the advantages of operating in air and space. So let's uh, appreciate that background. What I thought we could do is dig into some of your uh, operational imperatives sure. in a little more depth. So, you know, we, we all know that you have an incredible amount of background and experience in defense uh, community. Could you talk a little bit about how that experience shaped your development of those seven operational imperatives? Well, it's pretty straightforward. I'm a student of military history, certainly. Um, and most of my career has been spent thinking about uh, the intersection of technology and operations. And it goes back 20 years of Cold War experience and then uh, all the events that have happened since. And I, I'm back in government partly because I'm, I'm shaped by the fact that I know what it's like to have a peer competitor. I know what it's like to have a well-resourced adversary who's actively trying to defeat uh, you know, on the battlefield, develop means that are more uh, superior, superior to yours. Uh, that's not something we're used to. There aren't any uh, senior officers even who have had extensive experience against that kind of opponent. And I saw this coming going back about 12 years. I, I came into the government after being gone uh, for about 15 years and started looking at the intelligence. And I realized immediately that what China was doing was investing in capabilities that were explicitly intended to defeat the US ability to project power. They were coming after our, our high value assets, which they, I think, saw as vulnerabilities. And 12 years later, uh, they're still on that path. And I think we're, we're on it now too. 
uh, we were we were focused on counterinsurgency for a long time, and I was part of that. Uh, but I think we need to get our eye back on the ball of our our pacing challenges, we call it, and and focus more on uh, uh, China in particular, but also Russia, as current events are shown. So the the seven imperatives are laid out to basically get at all the things that I think are of highest priority in terms of ensuring that we have uh, Air Force and a Space Force that can deal with that patient challenge. Well, um, one of the things that you men men mentioned is the, the Space Force, obviously, and in conjunction with mm -hmm. China as a pacing threat, it's no, no secret that uh, the Chinese um, have turned, along with the Russians to a degree, space into a contested domain. Mm -hmm. Um, could you talk a little bit about what your approach is to educating people, the American public, as well as the Congress, as to the significance and the nature of this threat? And by coincidence, this morning I was up on the Hill. I had about a dozen senators with me. I gave them a briefing at a fairly classified level uh, on some of this, explicitly on some of the things that China has been investing in and what their implications are. And I can't go into a lot of detail about that, but I think it was eye opening for them. I mean, the next step is to talk more about what we need to do about that. And that's what the operational imperatives are about. We're, we're, we're trying to be sure that uh, we're not just going fast, but that we're going in the right direction. And I think there's been an emphasis on speed over the last few years uh, without enough thought and, and particularly enough analysis of our alternatives in choosing the right direction and coming up with the right sets of requirements for systems. And as you mentioned, I've had about 50 years of experience in this business now. I hate to admit it, but it's half a century. And uh, starting in the shadow of Vietnam and then through 20 years of Cold War and on. And most of that time has been about the intersection of operations and technology, trying to figure out how to get the most out of our investments, how to take advantage of whatever technology provides what can be, can be made available to get an operational advantage. And that's what I'm after with all those imperatives. That's great. So making sure that our congressional decision makers are aware of mm -hmm. the threat. Obviously, that's something that you're doing mm -hmm. uh, and uh, getting the word out to the American public. Uh, I think what's going on in Europe, too, will help in that in terms of elevating defense is something that we can't continue Absolutely. to take for granted. Unfortunately, yes. Uh, but a great segue. You mentioned a little bit on analysis and your focus on that arena. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on what you believe is the importance of having solid analytical uh, evaluation involved in the decision-making sure. process? Yeah, part, of, part of my background from the Cold War is that we, we did an enormous amount of operational analysis. This dates back to when McNamara was Secretary of Defense in the 60s. Um, he brought in some analytical techniques from civilian industry, actually. Uh, and I was, I was part of that a few years later where we did a lot of uh, modeling and simulation, a lot of computer game analysis, and just playing calculations to try to figure out what would be the most cost-effective way to solve a problem. What would be the best uh, combination of weapon systems or characteristics of specific weapon systems? And we worked that way for my whole experience during the Cold War. Uh, when I left government in 94, I came back you know, 15 years later, I didn't see that happening. There is still some of that. There's still a cadre of people who do that type of work, including in the Air Force and, and the Space Force. Uh, but we weren't using that kind of analytical backup or, or basis to drive requirements. A lot of things were being decided essentially on intuition. And I mean, professional opinions and intuition are of great value, but they need to be anchored in uh, some calculations right. sometimes. And I, I used to have a sign outside my office, and God we trust, all others must bring data. Um, I still believe that. I, I think uh, you can learn a lot by doing the math. And while things may sound attractive, when you look at uh, their full operational employment, as well as their cost effectiveness, they may not turn out to be such good ideas. And while it's important to go fast, it's just as important to go in the right direction. And so hopefully we can get to a place where we can make sure we've got sound decisions. Once you've got that, then you want to you know, lay it in a program that's going to get you to real operational capability quickly as you possibly can. That's great to hear. Now, I understand that you're doing that and uh, 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 building, inculcating that perspective inside the Air Force. As a bit of a follow on, um, how about across the Department of Defense in the context of doing those trade offs amongst all the services to determine mm -hmm. for a particular mission area what poses the greatest cost per effect? Do you see any progress in that arena being made? 
Yeah, I do. I've seen some pretty good analysis that's come out of Cape, for example, uh, since I've been back. Uh, one of the things I'm doing that's sort of helping that process, I think, is in the Space Force. Uh, space uh, Force has uh, responsibility for joint requirements from space. And so we've initiated an effort, D.T. Thompson, the Vice uh, Chief Space Operations, is, is, is leading that force, working with the other services, our own analytic communities and others to try, try to drive the space order battle for the future, which will meet uh, other services requirements for support from space. So I think that's a chance for the Space Force to take on a leadership role, uh, which is truly joint. You know, my mantra has been one team, one fight. And that team is the joint team. It's the, uh, it's the combined team, it includes right. our allies. You know, integrated deterrence is not just about the US, it's especially about our, our strategic partners. So we're trying to lead the way, if you will, in, in the area of space support to terrestrial operations for all the services, uh, integrate all their requirements, figure out a way to meet them, and then get on with that. Uh, very good. Now, we're spending records amounts on uh, science and technology efforts these days, and, and that's obviously uh, a good thing. But it's also important to recognize the deficit we've accrued mm -hmm. in our over the years and operational capabilities and the capacity. So how do you, what are your thoughts on striking a balance between those two? What we spend on, on S and T uh, and uh, relative to getting operational capabilities out of that? There's a lot of talk about the value of death and things that start, but don't finish. And what we've done over, over the years, I think is kind of pile up things on one side of the valley and not done enough to get them across to the other side. And at the end of the day, it's about priorities, resources, and requirements, about whether you get things to the other side or not. And you have to be disciplined about the things you start. Um, I've seen a few projects, I'll be blunt, that I don't think are ever going to go to the field, whether they're successful or not. I've seen a few others that I'll, almost certainly should go to the field if they're successful. And we need to distinguish those two. We need to emphasize the ones who are in the latter category. Uh, General Raymond, General Brown, and I are all going to be sitting down, looking at all of our programs in the S&T world, particularly the demonstration projects, and trying to make a determination about whether we think that they will make the cut, so to speak. Are they cost effective? Are they affordable? Uh, are they going to confer an operational advantage that matters? And for those that meet those tests, we're going to make sure they're funded to go on. And we're going to try to accelerate that transition wherever we can. That, that's a work in progress, but it's, it's important work. Um, I, I don't think we have a shortage of innovation. I don't think we have a shortage of technology. We have to do is make smart decisions about how we apply those things. Yes, sir. Um, in that regard, just a, a bit of a carry on to our last couple of questions that you addressed. We see um, all the services to a degree pursuing long range strike options, mm -hmm. uh, some of which um, some would say, I would say, uh, <laughs> are operating uh, or affecting arenas far out of their operating regime. And uh, some cost estimates put the, the ground-based uh, hypersonic missiles at around 40 to $50 million a shot. Um, in the Army's case, they're also planning to acquire their own ISR command and control and logistics systems to control these systems. Uh, and I, that's a huge bill. And some of us would say those duplicate Air Force functions. Um, are you engaging OSD in any way to make sure that the military doesn't duplicate capability in this era of constrained resources? Well, a couple of things. Uh, it's, it's good to have multiple ways to do something militarily. Sure. There's nothing wrong with some redundancy. It uh, makes the problem much harder for the threat. Uh, that, those capabilities have to be cost effective. So you make a good point there. Uh, I personally have no problem whatsoever if the Army wants to kill air defense sites so that our aircraft don't have to risk themselves to do that. So there are, there are rules for uh, sea surface or ground surface launched missiles, for example, for doing strike. And I don't have any problem with that at all, but they do need to be cost effective. If you look at what China's done to modernize, they have bought a lot of land-based missiles to target our air bases, for example, among other things, right? Uh, so it can be a cost effective investment, but you gotta be careful about what you're doing. And now the army in particular is pursuing hypersonics, which tend to be very expensive. So we've got to take a look at how those fit into the mix relative to other possibilities and including air delivery. Yes, if you look at the Pacific theater in particular, uh, there's not a land from which you can shoot missiles at somebody else that the US controls uh, where we would have complete authority over those missiles. So you got to think about that. So there are a number of factors that go into it, but in principle, I have no trouble with the other services helping us do our job. All right. 
another topic that's in the news lately is uh, join all domain command and control. Mm -hmm. um, we've been talking about that for over a decade now, and uh, we need it sooner rather than later. Um, could you talk a bit about the key areas that you think are most important to turning this concept into reality? Yeah, I, I, under it's one of the operational imperatives. And under it, I've asked people to identify the specific um, use cases, if you will, where information is taken from sensors, brought somewhere to be acted upon and presented to a decision maker in a form that makes a decision you know, easy, timely, uh, and beneficial and then take the results of that decision-making process and get it to people who are delivering weapons on target. And, and basically, uh, what, I, what I'm looking for in ABMS is much more specificity about the capability that we need and not the general idea that everything is connected, but specific connections that matter. And then we'll focus on developing them. And as I dig into this more and more, I, I'm discovering that we have some fundamentals that we need to improve on, communications, for example. Uh, we need to modernize some of our communication systems independent of anything else. Uh, so that, that work has to be prioritized as well. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm after return on investment in, in ABMS, Advanced Battle Management System, or in JADC squared. Uh, it's part of that analysis that I talked about earlier. Very good. Um, now, another related issue, concept, is Agile Combat Employment. Mm -hmm. um, folks use the acronym ACE. It seems to make a lot of sense, particularly in the Pacific where the, uh, we, we can't afford to have these hubs of highly concentrated mm -hmm. forces that the adversary could get to. Um, and uh, however, over the past several decades, DOD and the Air Force uh, has moved to a sustainment model that is optimized for budget efficiency, mm -hmm. not necessarily combat effectiveness. What are your thoughts on this and, and how do we square that circle in terms of paying attention to efficiency, but remembering that effectiveness is what it's all about. Yeah, agile combat employment is a sound concept. And it gets at the, course, the, the problem that we present an adversary with some uh, very lucrative targets in a number of forward deployed fixed air bases, right? Which are easily targetable. So one way to address that problem is to proliferate basing. Uh, you'd like to do it with a combination of deception, hardening and defense so that uh, the targeting problem becomes much more difficult for the adversary. And agile combat employment moves us in that direction. Uh, the tricks are identifying exactly what you need to do and resourcing it. And you have to think through uh, how do you have continuity of operations? How do you have the fuel and the ammunition and the life support and the other things you need? How do you have the maintenance capability that you need? Uh, how do you engineer some deception into that? Maybe some hardening if you can as well. And, and possibly defenses, so that you have a, a mix of capabilities that really extracts a high price from the other side before they can successfully attack. So that's what we're about. And I, and I think we've done a lot of exercises now. I was just at uh, US Air Forces Europe where they've been doing some things. In fact, they are doing some things right now to be prepared for what happens in Ukraine. Uh, so the, the, the principle I think is understood. People are starting to experiment with it. Uh, one, one aspect of that is airmen who can do more than one job. So if they're, they're at a, a, a hub away, away from the hub at a, on a, out on one of the spokes at a base, uh, they can perform a mix of functions as opposed to the one that they normally would do. So we're, we're starting down that path. I think we've taken some good steps, but we have a lot more to do. And we're going to have to put resources against it. Yes, sir. I, I would, um, having lunch with one of your staff members who will go on name to protect the innocent, <laughs> Uh, just recently who came back from a theater also talked about the doctrinal piece to this over yeah. the last 20 years um, operators from all the services have become used to very highly centralized control and uh, I, I would just offer that it's going to take a bit to reverse that to actually allow those who are at the edge of the fight to yeah. make decisions mm -hmm. in conjunction with the guidance that they've been given to uh, act on their own. Yeah, the, the fights we're worried about are different than the ones we've been in. Right. We've been in uh, one where we controlled time to a large extent, where things happened relatively slowly and in small numbers. And the fights we're worried about now, whether it's the, you know an invasion, an incursion, or an aggression against NATO, or an attempt to say you know uh, seize Taiwan by force, are are a totally different kind of operation. It's more like D-Day than an Eighth Air Force campaign over Germany, right? Um, 
Uh, so you have to be prepared to deal with a lot of objects that you're trying to understand and, and sort out. And a lot of things happening in a very compressed timeline. And you can't do all that at the highly centralized way. Even with all the GHC squared you can imagine, you're still gonna to have to break that fight up into pieces that are manageable because you want human control. You want operators in a position to make sound operational decisions at the right level for them to do it. But the oper but they've gotta be where the information can come to them in a digestible way, a processable way, and then use that information to make the decisions that are appropriate at that level. So we've got a lot of work to do. It's a very different type of thing than we've, type of problem operationally than we've been worried about for a long time. Yes, sir, very good. Um, you talked about humans in control. Let's switch a little bit to uh, some technological assist to um, our airmen. Uh, you commented recently on manned unmanned teaming yes. in terms of a, of a concept. Could you talk a little more about that topic? And particularly, does manned unmanned teaming look different for fighters than it does for bombers relative to, let's say, mobility aircraft? I mean, is it different depending upon the mission you're I think it can be very different. I mean, the mobility case, it's simply a question of autonomy successfully doing the function. Uh, people who, I'm not a pilot, but I've talked to a lot of pilots, including my chief of staff of the Air Force, who was commenting to me the other day that uh, flying a modern aircraft, you know, the aircraft largely flies itself. It's totally different than when he first came into, uh, into the Air Force. Um, so in some cases, autonomy will do a lot on its own. In other cases, you want close human supervision. So I think that the, the cases you mentioned are all significantly different. Um, my, my belief right now is that enough work has been done on the tactical level between things that DARPA has done. Uh, they've had a very good program there. Things that the Australians are doing in the Loyal Wingman and the Skyberg program in the, in the Air Force. I think that the technologies are coming together to allow us to do man-on-man -man teaming of a, a fighter, let's say, class aircraft with one or more uncrewed aircraft that accompanied it. And I think the mix of capabilities you put into that formation is still very much un uncertain. It's up in the air, but there are a lot of possibilities. What, what that opens up to you is some really interesting tactical options that you don't have when you only have manned aircraft. So we're gonna go forward with that. Um, I, I feel that the, the autonomy technologies, if you will, um, will move forward at a certain pace, but we need a platform upon which to uh, embed those technologies as they mature. So I think we can get to what I'll call a minimum viable product. And maybe it's one person, one pilot with a wingman and an NGAD or an F-35, or, or maybe it's more than that. And it's one set of functionalities originally. And then over time that develops and matures. So we're working with industry on this. We want to tap industry in a way that I don't think we've done enough of recently. Uh, so that that's one. On the bomber side, um, I think there's a lot of potential there as well, but I'm not as certain about what the rules of the uncrewed platforms are relative to the bomber. Are they following and just simply buses for munitions or do they have more sophisticated functions and lead and what degree of stealth might be appropriate? So we're gonna do a lot of work to explore that and try to figure out what the right mix is there. Uh, so that, that one's a little less well-defined in my mind right now. Um, you don't have to give me an exact date, but at what point you start actually buying some of these capabilities, deploying them to Nellis, and letting our, our warfighters figure out how to optimize or use or exploit these technological advantages through actual application. Uh, that's the path we're on. Uh, my mantra for uh, acquisition is get meaningful military capability into the hands of operators as quickly as possible. And uh, some of the programs I mentioned earlier, the technology programs, they'll continue in parallel. We'll work to get a platform, an uncrewed platform uh, that could work with NGAD while we're working on NGAD. So I would say at roughly the same time frame, we should have some things be out there. And I, I think we can couple new technologies with F-35 as well and do some things there too. So, uh, and I believe operator experimentation is gonna be a big part of this. Uh, one of the things I've seen with past technologies is a feel that operators are very creative about managing right. ways to use things that the engineers like myself didn't necessarily think about. And so we need to make that opportunity available as soon as we can. Some of that we can do with simulation. I hope we get the opportunity to do that as well. Well, we've got a paper unveiling tomorrow on man done man teaming. I'm looking I forward to it. You all will take a look at and it has some ideas in, in that respect. Okay. Uh, in terms of, and, and quite frankly, without going too much detail, you know, engineers have one perspective and operators have another. 
and it would maybe very useful to make sure that each understand each other's perspectives. You got that right. Forward. So that's yeah. kind of. And my, e are. each of my seven imperatives is led by a two person team. One of those people is an engineer or technical person, and the other person is an operator. And they work together as a co chairs, if you will, for each of the imperatives. No, it's awesome. It's, it's um, uh, this is the software development world does this. And I've felt for decades that this is the right way to approach this. The uh, traditional, you know, hand the requirement over to the, the engineer and wait for them to bring a product doesn't work very well. We've seen a lot no, of that. No, we did that in the 50s yep. and it didn't work out bad. Some of those cockpits were. They're, you, you've got to have an interchange between the, the, the customer and the provider right. uh, so that you have a meeting of the minds. And reality has got to constrain requirements a little bit, uh, but operational wisdom has got to drive the design as well. Yes. So it, it's a combination of the two. Yes. Let's switch and uh, talk a little bit about uh, the triad. The Air mm -hmm. Force is responsible for two legs of the triad and a major portion of our nuclear command and control mm -hmm. system. How do we go about, I mean, this is a huge challenge that, that you and the Air Force leadership faces. How do we go about funding the nuclear recapitalization at the same time we have these challenges in terms of recapitalizing our conventional forces? Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. We've seen this coming for quite a few years now. You know, we, we built the nuclear triad sort of all at once, and it's had like a 30-year life or so, and now we've got to recapitalize it. And it strikes the Navy and the Air Force particularly. Uh, the, the Columbia submarine for the Navy and both the, the Minuteman replacement and the B-21 uh, and the LRSO uh, and NC-3 programs, right? All that. So yes, and we're, we're now at the point where those bills are now at, at a magnitude where they significantly constrain what else you can do unless there are budget adjustments made to accommodate that. Okay, well, we're doing our best over here to try to articulate <laughs> the case for greater resources uh, not just for the Air Force, but the entire Department of Defense, because while we kind of focus on the challenges that you as a Secretary of the uh, Air Force, responsible for the Space Force and the Air Force uh, provide, we, we've got them to a degree across all the service. But with that, Mr. Secretary, thanks very much for taking those questions. Why don't we take some time and switch to uh, our audience uh, and uh, see what they have on their mind. So let's go for the first question. So let's try uh, Yasmin. Yasmin, go ahead. Hey there, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for doing this, Secretary. Um, so earlier you were mentioning that you were going to be looking at with General Brown and General Raymond, um, S&T projects that you guys are looking at. Um, that reminds me a lot of Night Court. I was wondering if you see it that way, that it's kind of the Air Force's version of Night Court. <laughs> Uh, we're going to be asking some very, I'm not, I'm not sure because I was not part of night court and I never went to them. Um, I've heard about them as I think we all have. Uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll take the time to look carefully at our, our various projects and we'll ask fundamental questions about, you know, their operational viability, their affordability, their technical maturity, uh, try to assess their priority relative to other things we can spend resources on uh, and then bin them. There, there are a few things I think we have in the pipeline that, uh, and I've seen this over my career multiple times, that even if they're successful, they're still not going to be operationally viable for one reason or another. Uh, a lot of those projects that you see in the science and technology side of the house come out of technologists who see the opportunity to do something technically, but don't necessarily think through all the implications of trying to do it operationally. So we're going to, we're going to assess that. That's why I'll do it with the chiefs. Um, there are some things where I think we'll say that is clearly a good idea. We're going to make sure that's fully funded in the five-year program, and we're going to make sure we get on a path to fielding. There are others where we're going to want to go do some more analysis and say, this looks like it might be a good idea, but I'm not quite sure about the cost effectiveness. So let's do some analysis to, to check that out. And there are a few others where we may just say, I, even if you succeed, uh, we're, this is not going to make the cut. We're not going to do this. Uh, you know, for a variety of reasons, or there are a lot of reasons why that could be true. Uh, so we're going to try to do some sorting, if you will, uh, to make sure we're focused on the things that have the highest payoff. In, in a world in which we were by far the dominant military power, we, we could afford to let a thousand flowers bloom. We, we can't do that anymore. We've got to focus our efforts on the things that we really need or that are going to make the, the greatest difference on the battlefield. So is this timeline for that? Is that for more of the fiscal year 2024 budget? Or I would assume that's not going to be relevant for this upcoming one. No, it'll be more for 24. We're, we haven't, we're, we're trying to wrap up 23 now, 
get it out the door. So it'll be more for 24. Okay, Mr. John Turpak. Thanks very much, Mr. Secretary. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we got you, John. Okay, good. Um, so I'd like to draw you out a little bit uh, on your recent comments about uh, hypersonics and not mirroring China. Uh, maybe you could talk a bit about what kinds of munitions you you do think the Air Force should invest in as the the primary kinds of weapons that we take to war. Are they are they uh, cruise missiles? Are they longer range direct attack kind of things? What do you see there? And uh, uh, if I could follow up also on the arrow, you you expressed some disappointment in its performance. I wonder if you're you're thinking about uh, moving those assets over to Hackam or some other kind of hypersonic approach. Yeah, um, a couple of things about hypersonics. First, first, the target set that we present to China is very different than the target set China presents to us. Uh, we're not uh, we're not symmetric, and because of that, we have needs for different munitions. So it isn't obvious that just because China is doing hypersonics that we should do, you know, immediately similar hypersonics. And the quantities that we need might be different, certainly, than the quantities they would need. Now, I think we need to focus our efforts there, too, and decide what really matters. Hypersonics give you two things. They're fast. They get there faster. Um, and they're harder for the other guy to defend against because of their maneuver speed and, and their maneuverability. They also, the third thing, I guess, is ambiguity about where they're going to go. Um, although you get some of that, at least with cruise missiles. So uh, the two categories, you know, boost glide vehicles and, and hypersonic cruise missiles, I think there's a role for both in our inventory. Um, they could come from different platforms. They can be, as the Navy and the Army are doing surface launch, or they could be air delivered. Um, the, if you're doing it air delivered, the idea of getting there fast is sort of uh, countered by the fact that you have to fly the airplane there before you launch the missile. So you lose some of that, that advantage. That's more prevalent with a ground-based system or a surface-based system. Um, the, the cost effectiveness has to be looked at carefully. You know, it's just, uh, as Dave mentioned, hypersonics can be very expensive. And the question is, can you do the job with conventional missiles at less cost just as effectively? And hypersonics are a way to penetrate defenses, but they're not the only way. You can penetrate defenses with, uh, with stealth and with countermeasures and so on. Uh, with a combination of tactics and things. So we need to look across the spectrum and make smart decisions about the munitions we buy. I do think there's a role for hypersonics. Um, with regard to Aero, um, it's had some test problems. That's not unusual in a development program. I, I'm hopeful that we're learning from that experience. Uh, and we have to make some decisions about that weapon system, like the potential weapon system, like everything else. Uh, right now, we're working on trying to sort out what exactly happened in the most recent incident. Uh, there are additional tests planned, and we'll learn more, and that's something that we'll be evaluating, I think, depending upon its progress as it goes forward. Thanks very much, John. Let's turn to Valerie and Sina. Valerie. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the nuclear triad, something that you were talking about a bit earlier, about the constraints that um, that part of the portfolio is, is having. Um, so how confident are you that you're gonna be able to keep B-21, GBSD and LRSO on track um, throughout your tenure? And are uh -huh. you planning on, I mean, are there any mechanisms that you could, that, that, that might be proposed or that you can kind of put into place that might make it easier for the Air Force to pay for those programs while not having to make huge sacrifices on the conventional side? Well, first of all, uh, all development programs can be expected to get into trouble at some point. Uh, there are degrees of trouble, and <laughs> they vary widely. Uh, the average development program for the Department of Defense overruns by about 25%. Uh, now, Bill Plant, who's coming back, I hope, is the ANS and, and myself when we were in office before, put B-21 on the path that it's on today. And all I can say there is so far so good, but we got a long way to go. Um, we also, I think, got uh, GBSD started uh, in the risk reduction phase, but we weren't responsible for the approval for the uh, engineering manufacturing development phase. The, you know, the administration hasn't finished its uh, or released the results of its nuclear posture review. So exactly what it's going to say about the mix of programs and how they're going to be structured and so on, I think I, I kind of want to get ahead of that. 
Um, I think we do need the triad, um, and I think we need to we, we need to make those programs execute as effectively as we possibly can. One of the things we did in the previous administration, less one under the Obama administration, uh, was we took a lot of the slack that was available out of the nuclear triad replacement programs, including the ones the Air Force is doing. So uh, we, we really do need to execute as well as we can there. And I think we have reasonable incentives in place on industry to try to encourage them to do that. But we'll be watching all those programs very carefully. All right, let's go to Steve and Lucy. Hi, thanks very much. I wanted to follow up on the, the hypersonic issue. Um, you, you've, ra you've raised some of these thoughts a couple of times over the last couple of months. Are you rethinking the Air Force's hypersonic strategy? And are you, think, are you thinking that you'd like to move the Air Force away from or deprioritize hypersonics? I think we need to make sure we've got the requirements right and the right mix of systems. Uh, you know, I, I was kind of walking through that, you know, rationale and uh, so on earlier. Um, and by the way, the bottom line answer your question is I rethink all of our programs all the time. Uh, you've got to keep an open mind about these things as you get more information. Um, but I think we are on a, a, a doing projects for air breathing hypersonics and for uh, boost glide vehicles. I think we're going to continue those in one form or another. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to prejudge anything that uh, hasn't been decided yet because we got a lot of results to, to get out. You know, I was around in the Pentagon when DARPA stopped their hypersonic glide vehicle program you know, several years ago after two failures. You can look back on that in retrospect and say it was a mistake. We should have continued to advance the technology. Uh, the Chinese continue to invest in their side. So I don't think there's any question that we're going to want to keep moving the technology forward. Uh, but the specific applications are going to be based on cost effectiveness uh, and a number of other factors. And uh, cost is going to be a big driver, I think. Hypersonics are not going to be cheap anytime soon. So I think we're more likely to have relatively small in inventories of hypersonics than large ones. But you know, that, that still remains to be seen. And hopefully we can drive the cost down where they're more attractive. Can you provide some more clarity on what the target, we mentioned the target set of the US versus China. What might that be? Land, maritime, combination of the two, um, and how, well, how? Yeah, that's part of the issue. Um, if, if our our job fundamentally is to is to deter and defeat aggression, uh, somebody commits aggression when they move somewhere else, uh, whether it's by ships across the Straits of Taiwan or in, in vehicles rolling into the Ukraine. So we want weapons that can deal with moving targets. Uh, the the earlier versions of hypersonics tend to be more fixed target close. Okay, let's move on uh, to uh, Bob Ho. Thank you, Mr. Secretary and uh, Dave for uh, sharing this today. I, I'd like to follow on a technology question related to artificial intelligence and, and your perspective, uh, Mr. Secretary, on the, the possibilities and the limitations of this as we move forward in this technology. Thank you. Well, that's a big question. Artificial intelligence is actually a, a basket of several technologies. And uh, we are quite a long ways away from what anything that looks like general human intelligence uh, by machines. But we do have some technologies that do things like pattern recognition, uh, data analytics, uh, machine learning, and, and other things that, you know, various forms of autonomy that are very valuable operationally. And uh, in, in many of the cases, those, those different subjects that technically that I just mentioned are, are maturing pretty quickly. And I've, I've been and had the opportunity to look at technology projects that are defense related uh, that apply all of them to various problems. So, and I think this is happening organically, effectively. People are coming out of grad school, they're going into defense companies, they're bringing this knowledge with them and they're applying it to the problems that they have. So I, I think we have to manage all of that, but uh, it, it's not going to be something that we centrally control. Uh, it's, it's a competitive tool for industry. And if you can provide greater capability using those kinds of technologies, then that's what we're going to want. Uh, and I think people are already investing in them pretty heavily uh, for various applications. There are other applications like um, in maintenance where predictive maintenance, for example, uh, there are applications where you connect to spirit beta databases for battle management reasons and sort through data uh, using learning algorithms. 
So all of these things have applications to specific problems and we should be investing in them and we should be finding the highest payoff return on those investments. So I, I, I think of them a little bit differently than most people. I don't think of AI as one thing. Uh, there is a lot of concern about ethical AI. The problem that comes up there most, I think, is, well, the combination of problems. One is uh, <clears throat> that you'll mistakenly kill people that are innocent. Uh, because you're letting the, uh, the AI, if you will, you know, the pattern recognition the algorithms that you have sort out who to kill. Uh, we're we're going to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, we're going to take uh, a lot of precautions to ensure that doesn't happen. And we have a doctrine that we have meaningful human control over our weapon systems. And we're going we're gonna to implement that. There are also biases in machine learning uh, where you get skewed answers because the data set and the way the algorithms were set up gives you skewed answers that uh, that often happens in, in personnel-related uh, settings. So there's a lot of work to be done with artificial intelligence. But I think the first thing for most people to understand is that it isn't one thing. It isn't something you just go out and buy uh, a computer that acts like a human being. That doesn't exist and isn't going to anytime soon. But you can buy tools that help you solve problems using a lot of forms of advanced processing and mathematics uh, that can be very valuable in a whole host of settings. So we do need to pursue those. Mr. Secretary, we're coming up on our time here, but I want to get at least one question in from the folks who've texted questions in because sure. there's a whole bunch of them. This one's from Mr. Ryan Ellis. Mr. Secretary, given your focus on China, what are you and your staff considering as options for dealing with a China that possesses great quantities of missiles, under surface to air defenses, and large numbers of aircraft when we do not? Is it possible to offset some of China's quantitative advantages with affordable air launch standoff weapons? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's all. <laughs> China is less a quantity problem, but they, they do that in terms of their the ships and tanks and, and aircraft. But they're buying a lot of weapons. They're buying a lot of missiles. Uh, the numbers that they can throw at one of our air bases are pretty high, for example. Uh, and it's not too hard to do the math on how many interceptors we have versus how many missiles they need to throw to, to, to get through. Um, so we, we do have a problem with quantity there, but I'm more concerned about quality. Uh, the, the, uh, I can't go into great many details about this, but I, I have been impressed by China in particular, but yet the Russia makes investments as well that are designed to defeat our systems. Uh, but China has been thoughtful in their investments. Uh, we talked about their missiles and their use of hypersonics earlier, some of the other things they're pursuing. They're pursuing good air to air capability in various areas. Some areas are quite behind us, uh, but there are other areas where they think they could be competitive or even have an edge, and they've invested in those. So we, we, we've got a thoughtful, uh, well resourced, uh, technologically sophisticated opponent. Uh, I think that this opponent is more formidable than the Soviet Union was. And I spent 20 years worrying about the Soviet Union. And occasionally they would, they would surprise us. They'd, they'd feel the technology we hadn't seen coming, that we had not an idea that we had not pursued, but that they had. So we, we're, we're watching China now very closely. I've been doing that for quite a few years. Uh, but we have to recognize that we're in, a, we're in a contest for technological superiority. And you know, we can't afford to make bad decisions about what we do. We got to be smart about that. And then we got to pursue things with adequate resources as efficiently as we can. Thanks for that, Mr. Secretary, and thanks very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to, uh, to chat with our audience. I'm sure that, that there are lots and lots of people that are interested in what you have to say, and I think everyone who's heard you would agree with me that we're extraordinarily fortunate in the Air Force to have an individual Absolutely. with your background and uh, capability, dedication, and motivation. So with that, and to our audience, we wish you all from Mitchell Institute a great aerospace power kind of day. <laughs>